Well, welcome everyone. My name is David Christinger, and I am the executive director of the Harris Writing Workshop at the University of Chicago's Harris School of Public Policy. I'm also the author of a new biography of the famed war correspondent Ernie Pyle. Uh, the name of the book is The Soldier's Truth. It came out uh, back in May. And it tells the story of, like I said, America's most famous war correspondent, even to this day, um, and, and his journey through the war from North Africa to Sicily, through the Italian campaign, um, and finally through Normandy, and then to the Pacific, where, where Ernie met his uh, untimely end. Um, for my presentation today, I'm going to start by reading a few pages from the beginning of the book. And then I have a short story on how the book came to be and the lessons that I learned from writing it. And then we'll have time for your questions. So this is from the, the Soldier's Truth. A warm summer rain soaked the men as they mounted muddy tanks and stuffed themselves into half tracks or jeeps pointed east. The smell of soggy gear and idling engines overpowered the sweet scent of the honeysuckle that climbed the gray siding of a nearby three-story inn. In a darkened shed out behind the inn, a 43-year-old pipe cleaner of a man sat hunched over his portable typewriter, ankle deep in straw, his back curved like a cashew. This morning, we are sort of stymied as far as moving is concerned, he pecked out with his index fingers to his wife back home in New Mexico. So in order not to waste the day, I dug up a white metal table out of a nearby garden. After nearly three months of hellish fighting through the hedgerow country of France, the Americans and their allies were 30 miles from the center of Nazi-occupied Paris. Capturing Paris had never been part of the Allies' plan, which involved a strike through to the Low Countries, across the industrial heartland of Germany, and straight to the heart of Berlin. The Supreme Commander of the Allied Forces in Europe, General Dwight D. Eisenhower, had grave concerns that if he marched his men into Paris, they would likely bog themselves down in brutal street-by-street -street combat with seasoned enemy troops and reduce one of the world's most magnificent cities to a charred graveyard. Not even an impassioned plea from the French commander, General Charles de Gaulle, had been able to dissuade him. Then, on August 22, 1944, the French Resistance's Chief of Staff, Roger Gowat, slipped through German lines on the outskirts of Paris and found his way to General George S. Patton's headquarters. The situation on the ground was not what the Americans thought, Gowat told General Omar Bradley's Chief Intelligence Officer. The resistance movement in the capital city had infiltrated the police force, and the week before, 15,000 Parisian policemen had gone on strike. More than that, the tens of thousands of resistance fighters had risen up to attack and harass their Nazi occupiers, even though they were armed with not much more than antique rifles and Molotov cocktails. In the days following the police strike, Many more Parisians of all ages and abilities dug up paving stones, collected piles of furniture and other odds and ends, and felled trees to construct an elaborate network of more than 400 street blockades. Even though they were outnumbered and now outmaneuvered, the Germans were nowhere near outgunned and would eventually crush the insurrection and inflict untold amounts of suffering and destruction as they retreated east unless the Allies came to the rescue. This new intelligence quickly reached Eisenhower, who dispatched the free French forces under his command to liberate their capital with American and British backup, while the rest of his forces pushed east and north toward the Belgian border. On August 25, 1944, Liberation Day, after a brilliant sun burned away the morning mist, Ernest Taylor Pyle, better known as Ernie to his millions of readers back home in America, stuffed his typewriter into its case, slung his musette bag over his shoulder, and hopped into a jeep with a couple of fellow combat newspapermen. Through most of the early part of the day, they felt their way through the garden-like country toward the outskirts of Paris, far behind the lead tanks and the more daring Allied correspondents, such as Robert Kappa, Ernest Hemingway, and Don Whitehead. 
The outer rings of the city hadn't been bombed much, Ernie was heartened to find, and most of the bridges were still safe to cross. Not at all desperate to be the first to secure that coveted, liberated Paris dateline under their bylines, Ernie and his companions entered the city from the south, along the Rue d'Orléans, where they discovered a pandemonium of surely the greatest mass joy that has ever happened. Women in brightly colored blouses and skirts lined the wide city streets in a carnival-like frenzy, leaving only a narrow corridor of pavement for the hulking military vehicles to navigate. Aging veterans of the Franco-Prussian War stood at attention, saluting their liberators. Excited children bounced and waved. Some ran along jeeps with their hands extended, hoping for a shake but settling for slaps on the back or pats on the shoulder. The demented choir of shrieking shells and zipping machine gun tracers the Allies had expected to encounter that day had mostly been replaced by cheers of Vive la France and Vive l'Amérique, even as pockets of German resistance in the city remained. They tossed flowers and friendly tomatoes into your jeep, Ernie later reported. One little girl even threw a bottle of cider into ours. Once, when the jeep was simply swamped in human traffic and had to stop, he continued, we were swarmed over and hugged and kissed and torn at. Everybody, even beautiful girls, insisted on kissing you on both cheeks. At least one ecstatic woman, with full pompadour and flashy earrings, reached out to grab Ernie by the slack in his collar. Before he could protest, she pulled his gray-bearded face, smudged with dust and lipstick, to her wine-colored lips. Thank you, oh thank you, she squealed between kisses. Thank you for coming. We all got kissed until we were literally red in the face, he later recalled, and I must say we enjoyed it. At long last, Ernie's ability to relish in the beauty of the world at war, something he feared might have atrophied inside his chest, suddenly flickered back to life. After inching through so much gratitude and joy for about an hour, Ernie had the driver pull over in front of a hotel near the Luxembourg Palace, across the river from the Louvre. They'd heard scuttlebutt that there were any number of desperate Germans holed up in the palace, firing indiscriminately at anything wearing green. While others fought, Ernie and two United Press correspondents wrote their first dispatches from Paris, in a room overlooking the street below. I had thought for me there could never be again any elation in war, Ernie wrote of that joyous day. But I had reckoned without the liberation of Paris. I had reckoned without remembering that I might be a part of this richly historic day. The day after the city was liberated, Ernie and crew puttered over the Seine and passed the Plants de la Concorde and the gardens of the Champs-Élysées. From there, they meandered their way to the gilt-edged Grand Hotel, across the street from the Allied press camp taking shape inside the Hotel Scribe. Like Mary and Joseph, when Ernie and his companions arrived at the Scribe, they were told there was no room at the inn. Not long after the Nazi propaganda officers who had occupied the hotel had fled, some 200 Allied correspondents, under an emotional tension, a pent-up semi-delirium, moved in and set up shop. Through the gilded lobby of the Grand Hotel, up a set of marble stairs and down the carpeted hallway all the way to the corner, Ernie found a room with clean sheets but no electricity. From the balcony three floors above the street, he grinned down in the afternoon sun at the joyous abandon below. After so much darkness, grateful Parisians had found the light. Standing there with several other correspondents, in as genteel a way as his tongue could muster, Ernie quipped, any GI who doesn't get laid tonight is a sissy. In fact, as one military study later showed, eight out of 10 unmarried American soldiers had liaisons at some point during the war in Europe. About half of married soldiers did too, but not Ernie. As the sun began to set, Ernie and his buddies made their way back across to the Scribe and claimed a table near the bar on the far side of the room. The booze did what Ernie wanted it to. It dissolved him. Soon, a couple of dozen war correspondents had him encircled, eager to hear a tale or two from the little man everyone loved so much. 
At one point, the other famous Ernie, Hemingway, bellied up to the opposite end of the bar with the swagger of a lonely warlord, seemingly resentful of Pyle's command of his hangers-on. Slap! Hemingway stung the air with a heavy hand on the bar top. A grenade he carried with him, just in case, pulled on the inside pocket of his field jacket. Let's have a drink here, he spat from the corner of his bearded mouth. The bartender babysitting Ernie and his buddies turned. Hemingway motioned for him. I'm Ernest Hemorrhoid, he roared across the room. The rich man's Ernie Pyle. Around 11 o'clock, in between rounds of cocktails, air raid sirens wailed, snapping everyone back to reality. In a raid of vicious retaliation, German bombers flew low over the rejoicing city, dropping their payloads and strafing anything that moved. Back suddenly was the little knot of fear in Ernie's stomach. Back was the animal-like alertness for the meaning of every distant sound. Back was the perpetual weight on his spirit that comes with death and dirt and noise and anguish. Jin saddened, Ernie Pyle realized he had reached his limit. What should have felt like a gigantic relief, celebrating the beginning of the end for Nazi Germany, had become another opportunity to die. The German air raid killed as many as 200 people who probably thought their war was over. Another 900 were wounded. The next morning, Ernie sent a telegram to his longtime editor, dear friend, and amateur business manager, Lee G. Miller. About done up, he started. Physically, everything was fine, but dogged clear down inside and can barely keep columns going, he wrote. That final German raid had brought home the truth. Ernie was wrung out. There was nothing left to give. It was time to come home. So those are the first few pages of The Soldier's Truth. And I started with that scene very purposefully because to me, it, it perfectly set up what I found to be the most interesting aspect of, of Ernie's career as a war correspondent. It was the fact that by the time Paris is liberated, Ernie has been overseas covering the war for about 29 months. And uh, that was with a few breaks coming home in there, but 29 months overall. And he had been at the front lines of the fighting for about a year of those 29 months. And so Paris is liberated. It's the most joyous day of the war for Ernie at that point. And then this German raid comes in and sort of, like I, like I say, snaps everybody back to reality. And, and, and the fact that the war is not going to end you know, the next day or the day after, and that there's still much more fighting, and that Ernie just couldn't take it anymore. And he wrote a column explaining this decision back home to his, at that point, about 12 and a half million readers. And Ernie wrote a daily column six days a week. Um, each column was anywhere between 700 and 1,000 words. So he's churning out, you know, five, 6,000 words a week for 29 months and and he had built up a readership of 12 and a half million readers at the very height of his fame it got up to 14 million which you know any newspaper columnist in america today would give their left arm to have those kinds of numbers um, ernie really was the voice of the american soldier he would joke sometimes that all he did was write letters home he wrote the soldiers letters home um, and that built him up this incredible and very loyal fan base that really relied on him to give the truth of what was what was really going on with their with their soldiers overseas. And so Ernie was very forthright about the fact that he was just completely exhausted, that the war had totally wrung him out, that there was there was really nothing more for him to give. And I remember the exact day that I first learned about Ernie Pyle. Um, I'm slightly embarrassed to tell this story, but it's the truth. Um, I remember the exact day because it was Memorial Day 2016, and I was in Okinawa, uh, Japan, 
And I was there as sort of an amateur historian trying to find out the truth about what my grandfather experienced uh, during the Battle of Okinawa at the end of World War II. Um, the battle started April 1st. It went for three months. It was some of the most hellish uh, and, and, um, and violent fighting of the Pacific. And at the, uh, at the tail end of my trip to Okinawa, I hired a local historian who was able to take me around to all the different battlefields that my grandfather had been at. And at the end of the, our day together, he took me to the very southern end of the island, which is where the Japanese um, military leadership sort of made their last stand. And what's there today is a memorial and a museum. And the memorial is called the Cornerstone of Peace Memorial. And it's based off of the design of the Vietnam Wall in Washington, D.C., this black granite with names in, inscribed. If you've ever been to the wall in Vietnam, you know there are about 58,000 you know, plus names that are inscribed there, and it's this huge, massive wall. Well, during the Battle of Okinawa, 260,000 people lost their lives, and that was both the Okinawan civilians living there, the Japanese defenders of the island, and then the allies who, who fought to, to conquer the island. And so they laid out their walls in these sort of wave-like patterns, and, and it's this wave after wave of black granite. And the tour guide asked me if I knew anyone who my grandfather had served with who was killed and uh, because we could make an etching of their name. And I didn't have that sort of granular level of detail of my grandfather's story, mostly because, like many men of his generation, he wasn't a talker. He didn't like to tell his his war stories. Um, I was able to piece together much of what he experienced through the records of his unit. Uh, but at that time, I didn't have that level of detail of, you know, what were the names of the men that he served with who were killed. So I was standing there kind of sheepishly. And the tour guide said, oh, don't worry, I'll take you to a name that I'm sure you'll recognize. And he took me to see Ernest Taylor Pyle. And in my mind, in that moment, I couldn't register like who that was. And clearly this, this uh, tour guide as assumed that I would know who this person was. And the thing that instantly came to mind for me was, oh, is this the name of the guy that they based Gomer Pyle off of? And that was the first thing I thought of because I remember watching reruns of Gomer Pyle with my, with my dad when I was a kid. And he sort of shakes his head and, and he says, you know, you flew all the way to Okinawa to try to figure out what your grandfather experienced and what soldiers like him experienced, and you've never read Ernie Pyle. And again, he's looking at me like I have two heads. And, and he said, well, Ernie Pyle was killed during the Battle of Okinawa, um, but he had served in Europe as a, as a war correspondent, had been the voice of the American GI. You know, he's really talking him up. So I made it my mission when I got home from that trip to buy whatever I could find online of, of old Ernie Pyle books. And I started with perhaps his most famous one, which is Brave Men. And it tells the, the stories from his time covering the campaign in Sicily, Italy, and France. Um, and really sort of ends with Ernie coming home from, from Paris, which is where, where, again, I start my book. Um, and the thing that jumped out at me about Ernie's writing and what made me fall in love with him in, in you know, sort of this, I wish I could write like him sort of way, was how he was able to humanize the people who were serving overseas. And one of the most common ways that he would do that was he would focus on the small details, you know, what they were experiencing day to day. He would write about the foot cream that they would use when, when they, you know, had toe fungus. He would write about the food. He would write about the sleeping conditions. He would write about, you know, all those little details that would build up to sort of create this mosaic, this picture of what our troops overseas were experiencing. Then once he had, you know, sort of um, ingratiated himself to a group and the soldiers would start to open up to him, he would interview them and, and, and give a voice to them. And he would name their names. He would include their, their uh, you know, home city and state. Sometimes he'd even include their home address. Um, and just, again, to show the power of, of Ernie's column, um, he got 
uh, a variety of policy changes enacted because of the things that he wrote. Um, he made soldiers sort of 15 minutes of fame um, and units and divisions even gave them uh, the recognition and the fame that that they you know felt that they deserved um, to the point where you know these soldiers who had their addresses in, included in the columns, people from all over the country start sending letters and uh, of let letters of support and community and connection, which you know I can imagine being a really powerful experience for those families. Um, generals joked that their units performed better when Ernie was around because the soldiers would want to impress him. They would want to be featured in his columns. They would they wanted his autograph. They wanted to tell him stories, um, and he basically became this translator, this spokesperson, this this person who could who could let readers into this world that they had no experience with. And so he he was able to humanize and to tell those those small details and build up really some trust with the reader, the reader beginning to see the war through Ernie's eyes, right? Because they believe what he's saying. And so when it be, when it came time later in the war to talk about hard truths, right? To talk about the fact that the Normandy invasion, you know, should have gone the other way, but it didn't. Um, the fact that the war was going to continue even after Paris and that more people were going to die and that, that there were people who were totally wrung out from the Normandy campaign and we're just expecting them to keep going and keep going. These, these really hard and difficult truths, um, he had prepared people for those by building up to those hard truths. And it, and it started to, to really affect the way that I saw myself as a writer, um, the way that I teach writing uh, at the public policy school where I teach this idea of how do you build trust with a reader? How do you build trust with an audience? What are the things that we do that help us lose trust um, with a with a writer or with a communicator? And, and the work that Ernie Pyle did as a World War II correspondent is just is, is textbook. You know, some of the policy changes that he got um, enacted, he got it so that troops serving in combat at the front lines would get extra duty pay for the hazards of that job so they'd be paid more than people who were far behind the lines and still doing an important job and Ernie would profile them you know just as often as he would profile troops on the front lines he wanted to show how the whole thing really worked and and how how um, you know the military operation really looked um, but he got that passed. He got the company that made the Willys Jeep to change the design of the shifter because he had written a column about how the soldiers hated the shifting knob and the shifting mechanism. He got all these different recognitions for soldiers uh, passed through the military hierarchy. So things like the stripes on the side of the uniform along the the wrist that would show how long someone had been overseas. That was something um, that Ernie pushed for. Uh, having medics properly recognized for the work they were doing. Like Ernie took up these causes and really um, ingratiated himself to soldiers and got to the point where they would open up to him about the more difficult truths. And it became Ernie's job of trying to translate that for a reader. All while, you know, uh, doing this without upsetting the military censors and without upsetting the the leadership of the military, um, and so the, that's that's what I wanted to figure out when I when I started writing this book was how did he do this right? How did he accomplish everything that he accomplished, and how is like I say a forty three year old pipe cleaner of a man? He was you know barely over five feet tall. He weighed barely over a hundred pounds. He had no, uh, you know, combat correspondent experience. He had no military expertise. He had no foreign policy expertise. He had come up through the ranks as a column writer and as a traveling correspondent. And he used those skills to report on the war in a completely new way. Um, and so the book uh, that I wrote about Ernie, The Soldier's Truth, weaves together a few different strands. One is it tells Ernie's story from the beginning of the war to the end of the war when he's killed and goes through the highs and lows of his professional career, of his personal life, 
Um, but woven into those two narratives is the story of me retracing his steps through the war. And this is something that was really important to me to try to understand you know, what was the impact of the reporting, the long-term impact all these years later of the kind of stories that Ernie told and the way that people started to understand the war as he described it. What were the lasting impacts of that? What were the things that Ernie didn't report on? What were the things that he didn't know anything about and couldn't have reported on? What are the things that we know now about World War II and, and we know now about how things have played out that might change the way we see the kind of reporting that Ernie did? Those were all the questions that I wanted to try to answer. And I was uh, just amazed, quite frankly, with how much of World War II didn't really end for a lot of people. Um, the damage is still there. The scars are still there. The long-term trauma is still there. And also there are, there are glimpses of Ernie all over the world. Um, you know, even tiny little villages in France where Ernie wrote a, one column about that tiny little village and now, you know, there's a placard outside the village's town hall with the quote from Ernie's column there describing, you know, some situation that happened there during the Normandy campaign. I mean, um, people really um, gravitated to Ernie and, and being written about by Ernie was, was such a privilege and such a, you know, extraordinary accomplishment that, you know, I was even finding cases of World War II veterans who had passed away and in their obituaries, it was remarked that they had known Ernie Pyle or that they had been written about Ernie Pyle or their unit had been written about by Ernie Pyle. It really was uh, a mark of, of distinction. Um, and so that's, those are some of the questions that I tried to answer throughout the book. And, um, and there's a, there's a much bigger focus on, on mental health in this book than I think a lot of previous books about Ernie Pyle and about war correspondence and, and really the war in general. Um, and, and I'm, I'm quite proud of how, how it's all turned out. And I think, um, it's, it's a great resource for anyone who has some sort of family connection to the war and they want to better understand what that person might have experienced or what they might have gone through, but also looking at the long-term impact of World War II and, and what lessons can we see all around us today? What are the, the lasting impacts today of, of this thing that, you know, is getting farther and farther into our, you know, historical memories? Now, at this point, I'd be glad to take any questions you might have, um, whether it's about writing books or teaching writing or about Ernie's story in particular, about World War II. I'm, I'm more than happy to, to take questions and I'll give my best, my best answers. How are you? I'm doing really well. How are you? Good. Where, where are we talking to you? I am at my office at the University of Chicago. I have a a little bit better uh, lighting in here than my my subterranean office. <clears throat> well, thanks for joining us. Um, my first question to you is: um, How on earth did you get to to write that book? Because I am so so jealous that you got to what travel the world in the footsteps of my superhero. <laughs> well, I so I as I mentioned in the video, I I only really started my journey of you know my Ernie Pyle fandom began in in 2016. Um, and in 2019, I was working as a columnist at the New York Times, and they were uh, the paper was doing this big uh, year-long uh, series of articles on the 75th anniversary of the end of the war, and it was starting in um, in 2019 and going into 2020. And so when I found out about that, um, I had been reading so much Ernie Pyle. I, he was really front of mind. And I and I asked my editor, I said, has anyone gotten the anniversary of D-Day yet? Has anyone picked that? And um, and she said, no, no one's no one's picked that yet. And I said, well, I want to do a piece about how Ernie Pyle uh, reported on D-Day and what his experiences were. 
And my editor had learned about Ernie Pyle when she was in journalism school. So that had that sort of checked that box for her. And she said, yeah, let's let's do it. So I said, can you send me to France for the <laughs> so I can walk the beaches? And they said, no, we can't send you to France, but we can send you to Dana, Indiana, which is where Ernie was born. And there's this fantastic museum there um, dedicated to Ernie Pyle. And so I ended up writing this piece for the 75th anniversary of D-Day. And um, it came out in 2019. And just a few days later, after the piece came out, I got an email from the editor who I worked with on this book. And he said, I read your piece about Ernie Pyle. I read the other columns you've written. I love your voice. I think Ernie Pyle is ready for another book. If you want to write that book, let me know. And I can assure everyone in the uh, audience that is not normally how that works. Um, normally, you you know toil for a long time to get an agent, and then you toil for a long time to put together a proposal, and then you send it out to you know twenty different publishers, and and you hope that one person takes it. I got very lucky. My editor is a huge Ernie Pyle fan, um, and when we talked, he he asked me. You know, there's been other biographies about Ernie Pyle. Um, lots of people have written about Ernie Pyle. What are you going to do that's different? And I had been reading um, a book called Confederates in the Attic by Tony Horwitz, which is, you know, basically a history of the Civil War, but told through this modern day lens. And what he does to tell the story is he becomes a uh, Civil War reenactor and, and really tries to understand the psychology behind like why we're still so obsessed with the civil war in the United States. And so I said, I kind of want to do that. I want to follow Ernie, you know, through the war. I want to go back, go to all the places where he went. I want to see what traces are still there of him. I also want to be able to see, you know, what do we know now that Ernie could not have possibly known, you know, at the time about what was happening or what it meant or, or uh, that sort of thing. And when I told him the idea, there was this sort of long pause on the other end of the phone and I thought, that's it. I blew it. This is a horrible idea. <laughs> he hates it. He, and, and he said, well, you know, I was Tony Horowitz's editor. And I can assure you that I had no idea that that was true. And so it really was one of those, like, the stars all just kind of aligned. Um, I written this piece. It spoke to this editor. He loved my idea for how to tackle it. And here we are all these years later. Um. Actually, uh, I've been to Pyle's uh, final resting place in Punchbowl Cemetery mm -hmm. in Hawaii. Um, it's it, it's not a headstone. You, you have to look for it carefully to, to find it. Um, you. And I should add that um, a group of us with friends, we were did our first ever Italy tour uh, just a couple of weeks ago. And we stood below... Um, a very high, rugged mountain at San Pietro. Yes. And I tried to point out where Captain Wasco had lost his life, Captain mm -hmm. Wasco being the subject of Powell's perhaps most celebrated column, mm -hmm. um, the most moving column. And then we actually went to Wasco's grave at uh, Anzi Natuno graveyard, 7,700 Americans interned there. Um, I was amazed, actually, without going on too long, that... Um, the wall of the missing in the chapel has some three thousand uh, names on it, which is twice as many that you as you find in Colville Sumer. Um, so, I've been a lifelong fan of Ernie Pyle. I wrote a biography of Robert Kappa, and uh, yeah. I was always impressed with just how close he was to other correspondents and um, how beautifully he wrote. Um, what was the making of Ernie Pyle? Why why did it get so good and I, you know, I think about how many words he's churning out. Um, I've been a journalist since I was in my early 20s. I still regard myself as a hack. Um, how? What was the making of Ernie Pyle? What, what made him so good? And tell us a bit about his background. Sure. Well, it's probably fair to say that being a war correspondent was Ernie's, like, third profession, really. Um, so he went to Indiana University, he studied economics, but he really fell in love with journalism. He wrote for the student paper. Um, he wrote some kind of travel dispatches when he traveled with the baseball team to Japan. So he was kind of getting his feet wet. And then in his last year at university, he was offered a job to be uh, basically a cub reporter for a small newspaper in Indiana. And so he dropped out of college 
much to his parents' chagrin because they really wanted him to graduate. But the way he looked at it was the only point of going to college was to get a job and he got a job. So why, why finish college? Um, he worked in Indiana for a little while and then he made his way to Washington, D.C. And that's where I would say that's kind of like his first career in journalism was as a copywriter. Uh, he was writing a lot of headlines. He was writing a lot of summaries. So he had to get really good at being concise and clear. And he got a reputation for that of being someone who could talk to anyone who could synthesize information, make it, like I said, clear and concise. He worked his way up through the paper, but every job that he got, every time he was promoted, he kind of didn't like that job more than, you know, he didn't like being an editor as much as he liked reporting. He didn't want to be the boss. He eventually became the boss of, of the paper, the managing editor, but really didn't enjoy it. Um, and he, uh, to sort of, fill in the time that that he had when he wasn't doing his reporting, he became an aviation columnist in the ver very early days of aviation. And so he was writing about pilots and about flights and, uh, you know, near mishaps and crashes and all these different things. And that ended up being really helpful to him once the war started, because so many of those pilots that he had gotten to know became pilots in the Air Corps. So once he, you know, got to England, he was able to kind of, you know, speak the lingo. He kind of knew some people, um, especially officers that could kind of get him into certain places. So so that was kind of his second career in journalism. So he, he learned to be very clear and concise. He learned a lot about aviation and about the pilots that fly planes. But then he became a roving, roving correspondent. And this is the seven years that he's crisscrossing the country during the Depression. Um, he ended up writing about if you if you took all the columns that he wrote in the seven years and you laid them out you know from beginning to end it would fill about 31 average size books like that's how much he wrote i mean just an incredible output six days a week you know thousand um thousand words a, a piece and he had to go find stories and he had to meet people and he had to talk to people and he was telling human interest stories he wasn't telling hard news he was trying to find those stories that had been kind of lost. Um, and so by the time the war starts, he knows how to write clearly and concisely and, and pack a punch. He knows all about aviation. He's crisscrossed the country, living out of suitcases, telling these human interest kinds of stories. So when he shows up to England uh, and the war has started, really what he, he does is he just keeps writing a travel column. You know, he keeps sort of traveling around, meeting people, getting their stories and reporting them back. And so it, it was a, sort of a very natural progression for him, even though, you know, I would say most people wouldn't pick him out of a lineup as, you know, a rugged foreign correspondent who's covering war. He was in his early 40s. He's a very small man. He had white hair. He was very quiet. He was very shy. He didn't like to talk. Um, and, you know, like you said, he was very close to so many other correspondence, Robert Kappa, uh, and he had a very close friendship. Robert Kappa was devastated um, when Ernie was killed. Um, I believe he just uttered something like, you know, Pyle got it and then proceeded to get drunk and try to forget it, um, which was a very Kappa thing to do. Um, and, you know, so so he he was actually a very logical person to do the kind of reporting that he pioneered, um, even though he was sort of an unlikely uh, correspondent. What was the mechanism that made him so popular in terms of his readership? How did he get 14 million Americans to be reading his reports? Well, I think for, for one, it was, he was a great writer, you know, especially in North Africa, um, as the, as the, the tide sort of turned against the, the Germans and, you know, M Montgomery's coming up, uh, from the south, and and the Americans are finally pushing from the west, and they're in this you know movement to kind of trap them in in Tunisia. Um, that's really where Ernie's reporting started to kick off. And one big helpful thing that happened was Eleanor Roosevelt wrote about Ernie Pyle in her daily column, and she had a huge readership. And she basically said, "I don't go a day without reading Ernie Pyle. Like if you want to understand what's going on in North Africa, you got to read Ernie Pyle." Um, then, like I said in the video, he was so good at humanizing 
the the soldiers that he was covering. So he didn't talk about formations and movements and this division and that division. He talked about the individual soldiers. He gave their names, he gave their addresses. He he very much, it's sort of like that small hometown newspaper kind of treatment, right? Where they're trying to highlight all the people in the community that have done something interesting. So there's this natural sort of curiosity of like, are they going to talk about my son's unit, you know, is Ernie going to talk about where my son is or my my father or my whoever? Um, and so, you know, it's almost like um, like a lottery, right? People are reading it to sort of see what Ernie's going to say next and 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 to be very much in the know about what's happening. Um, then he also he worked for a newspaper that was really, really good at um, getting his column syndicated. So he was not just writing for one newspaper, he was writing for hundreds of newspapers. And um, at the height of his popularity, he was in 98 of the top 100 cities in America. Um, wow. And this was also at a time when there were just far more newspapers. Uh, yeah. People re relied on newspapers much more for their information than they do today. So I think, again, it was just that like perfect timing, perfect preparation for him professionally. And then people were really hungry for the kinds of stories that he was telling because he was the only one telling them. And then after North Africa, you see lots of people trying to imitate Ernie. And even today, you know, there are lots of people who write in a very similar way because Ernie sort of redefined the genre in a lot of ways. Well, I'm one of those copycats too. So oh, I count me, count me in. Yeah, totally. uh, I think anybody that tries to copy Ernie Pilot is on is on the right route. Uh, yes, can't go wrong. Um, yes. Can you tell us a little bit about the psychological burden, the the um, the moral wounds, the the effect that the war had on Pyle? Um, I know that in the summer of 1944, he basically had a breakdown. He'd uh, seen, I think he use the words far too many heads of dead young Americans yeah. lying like litter in the streets. Um, tell us about the personal toll that being a correspondent took on Ernie Pyle. Well, he he went through phases and it, it's actually pretty interesting um, when you when you see his entire career as a correspondent in North Africa, he's writing letters constantly saying, I love war. I'm having such a good time. You know, like the simplicity of life at the front is such a refreshing change of pace from the grind of, you know, modern life. And he found it a, almost an escape was, you know, he was he was having this grand adventure. He was meeting people and doing interesting things. And he was healthy. He felt very good. Um, Ernie always drank. He was he was a very heavy drinker. But in North Africa, it's very hard to find alcohol. So he was kind of on a a break from the booze um, and and he started feeling very, very healthy and he liked the the um, African sunshine. You know, there were all these like things that he was so happy about. Um, then he goes to Sicily and Sicily like totally knocks him on his butt. Um, and, and part of it's because the grinding pace of the battle, the, he calls, he calls it, uh, there's a column where he says, you know, it's the choking dust, it's the endless miles of marching, it's the relentless sun, it's the, you know, the constant moving, the the no sleep, the, the cold food, the, you know, all, everything sort of um, built and built and built. And he had um, sort of physical breakdown, which he called combat exhaustion or combat fever, and he ended up going to a hospital. Well, then he went back to the United States and sort of recuperated and then went to Italy during the, the winter campaign, which was a terribly um, uh, horrible time to be there. Um, lots of death, lots of destruction. You know, you have the Rapido River incident. You have the Battle from Monte Cassino, San Pietro, you know, all these places where it was just, you know, a grind, um, hundreds and hundreds of casualties each time. Um, there were There was lots of... Uh, frustration among the soldiers that he was embedded with over how the military, how the officers were were leading the campaign, but he was trying to, you know, uh, thread a very delicate needle that way. And so by the time he gets to France, it's been months and months and months of, uh, of reporting, of frontline reporting, of, you know, being under, uh, under barrages, um, being shot at. He had, he had many near-death experiences 
Um, the last one that really shook him was in Anzio, uh, where he was staying in a villa with other war correspondents and a German bomb exploded right next to the villa and kind of blew him out of uh, the bed he was in and um, or that he had just gotten out of. And he had this, you know, sort of feeling of, well, if I'm going to get killed, I'm going to do it someplace like Normandy. I'm not going to stick around in Italy to get killed. But his his um, worldview got very fatalistic at that point, right? He did not think he was going to survive the war. Um, he also um, was dealing with problems at home, which made it very difficult for him to do his job. His wife was mentally ill. I talked to a couple of um, doctors and, and explained sort of what I knew about his wife's condition. And they said that was probably bipolar disorder. Um, this was before that was a diagnosis, before they had treatments that were effective, before they had medications. And so she battled tremendously with, um, with him being gone. That was very difficult for her. Um, she attempted suicide many times. She abused alcohol. She abused uh, drugs. She was not getting very good treatment. Um, and, and that weighed very heavily on Ernie the whole time he was overseas, right? He had this wife who was fighting this battle at home, but he felt very pulled to do his duty as a correspondent and trying to, you know, navigate those waters was incredibly difficult for him. Um, I think I came across uh, an incident in Cherbourg uh, when he was with Kappa. Um, and um, there's a really great column that he wrote called Street Fighting yes. um, that I used in my biography of Kappa. But anyway, um, Kappa was really taken aback by the fact that here he was in a, the middle of nowhere in a, a suburb of Cherbourg in, on a rainy day in June of 1944. And uh, every soldier that, that heard the name Ernie Pyle, it was like a Hollywood celebrity had arrived. He was worshipped. Uh, Kappa was desperate to find something to drink and none of the GIs would give him any of the liberated bottles, but they would give Ernie Pyle a bottle. They'd give him anything, you yes. know? Yes. So my point is that, mm -hmm. is that um, Pyle, while he was doing his job, was a was a huge star. Yeah. Um, and that fame, I think he felt very uncomfortable about that. You know, he yes. received the Pulitzer Prize. They were making a Hollywood movie. Um, I mean, it was something that he, another thing that he had to deal with was this sense that, He'd lost control of his own persona. He was this star that, you know, he knew that in his soul and heart that he he wasn't that guy. Um, so I wanted to to ask you um, uh, a little bit about how Ernie Pyle met his end because it is a it is a tragic story. It's almost as if, you know, the um, time ran out. He played too many cards and too many games. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how Pyle ended his life? Sure. So he. Uh decided to go to the Pacific to cover mostly the Navy, but he also wanted to cover the Army and the Marines. There were a lot of pressure from the Navy to have him go to the Pacific because they wanted the pile treatment. They wanted the newspapers to care about the Pacific War, which did not get as much coverage in American media as the European conflict did. Um, and his wife was particularly ill at that time and had been institutionalized. And the doctor said that it would be months and months and months before she would be okay enough to consider going home. So he had this thought of sort of like, well, I've got nothing better to do. I might as well go to the Pacific. Um, he very much played it safe the first few months he was there. He traveled on different ships. Um, he stayed on different islands that had already been conquered and, you know, had basically been turned into American military bases. And the... Um, sort of lack of frontline fighting kind of made for what he called more dull writing. He just didn't think the things that he was writing were as interesting in the Pacific as they were in, in Europe. And that kind of annoyed some of the sailors that would read his pieces and, and, and basically be told that their war wasn't as hard as the European war. Um, but he, as the, as the war is sort of uh, coming to an end, he sees an opportunity to go along with the Marines on the invasion of Okinawa, which starts April 1st, which my grandfather was a part of. And um, one thing that's different about that invasion than the previous invasions, including Iwo Jima, which was the, the next one closest to Okinawa, was the Japanese did not defend the, the beaches. They retreated back on the southern tip of the island and created these very difficult defensive lines. 
um, a succession of defensive lines. But basically what that meant was Ernie landed on an uncontested beach. And he thought personally that that was a sign that that better be your last invasion. It's never going to be like that ever again. And he actually wrote a letter to his wife to that effect saying, I'm never going to go on another invasion. This was my last one. I'm going to run out the clock until the war is over and then I'll be home and I'll take care of you. And, you know, we'll, we'll live our lives. Um, and then he lands on a tiny little island on the northwest coast of Okinawa on the day after an army and invasion. The army had invaded. This little island had a few runways on it that the Americans wanted to take over so that they could use them for bombing runs on Japan. Um, now, Ernie was, was killed on that island, and there is quite a bit of confusion about the exact order of events and how things happened. And I think this speaks partly to the military censorship at the time, but also this, this kind of, I would say, a desire to have Ernie die a kind of a more heroic sounding death in a way. Um, so the way the, the story went was that um, Ernie was on, in a Jeep with these other officers. They were heading towards a command post and a Japanese machine gunner opened up on their Jeep. The Jeep stopped, the men jumped into the ditch, um, and then Ernie Pyle raised his head up above the berm and asked if everyone was okay, and boom, he gets hit by, a Jap by the Japanese machine gunner. That's the kind of standard story. Well, then during my research and, and as I was you know, interviewing people and reading more and, and really digging into some of the archival material, there were certain questions that I don't have good answers for. One was, there's a picture of Ernie um, after he was killed where he's wearing a tan uniform. Um, that would have been a very silly thing to wear on a Pacific Island where, you know, only high ranking officers wore tan. Um, he also wore these aviator sunglasses, which he hardly ever wore. Um, that, that was, again, could have been a signal that he was some kind of high ranking officer. Um, and then he was in a Jeep with men who were much younger looking than him. And so there's there's some speculation that the Japanese machine gunner saw him in the Jeep and said, there's an old man with white hair who's wearing a tan uniform and he's got aviator sunglasses on. He must be important. So let's get him. Um, but then there was a picture taken of Ernie after he was killed and there's no blood except this little trickle that comes out of his mouth. And um, there was a, a, a scholar who studied the ballistics around it. And what he thinks happened, and I think this makes a lot of sense, what he thinks happened was Ernie dived into the ditch. And then you have to kind of imagine he was like seated like this. So the ditch is behind his head and he's got his back to the ditch and, and, and he's, you know, sort of bracing. And then the dirt behind his head was basically shot away by the machine gun and then the, the bullets would have gone through the dirt into the back of his head. So that's why there was no blood on the front side of his face. Now, does that, does that make him less heroic of a figure? I don't think so, right? I mean, he, he was there. He was on the front lines. He was killed. But the story of him, you know, raising his head up and saying, hey, is everyone okay? You know, that, that says something about what people wanted to think about Ernie Pyle, which was that he cared about everyone else except himself. You know, he was there for the soldiers, he wasn't there for himself. And so, you know, in the book, I tell kind of both of those stories and, and sort of leave it up to the reader to decide, you know, what they think might have happened. Um, but I don't think it, it means anything um, except that it was a very tragic end to an incredible life. Um, and, you know, I've gotten questions from people who say, you know, do you think he would have been as famous if he hadn't have been killed? I do think he would have been famous. I don't know if he would have the kind of saint um, distinction that he gets because he was killed. Um, you know, it's one of those like uh, just sort of perfectly tragic stories, right? That he he served, he did everything he could, and then at the end he's killed. Um, I've also gotten questions. What do you think Ernie would have done after the war? And first of all, I think he would have not written for a while. He would have kind of disappeared because, like you said, he did not like to be famous. He did not like um, all the demands on his time, all the letters and phone calls and, and everything else. 
I think he would have escaped for a little while. And then I really do think he would have found a way to try to report on the soldiers coming home and trying to tell those stories. And I do wonder how differently the end of World War II would have been if Ernie had been there to help tell some of those kinds of stories because so many people were just ready to move on. They didn't want to talk about the war. They didn't want to think about the war. Could Ernie have told stories that would have made people sort of stop and say, oh, maybe we do need to think about this or we do need to process this? Would that have made it a better transition for those millions of of men and women who came home and found that their neighbors like didn't really understand, you know, what they had been through, despite, you know, all the great writing that was done. Um, I think Ernie would have done that with, at least that's what I hope he would have done. Cause I think we could have benefited from that. Um, I think we definitely would have benefited from that. I want to make a couple of uh, comments. Uh, sadly, we're running out of time. I, I could spend all afternoon, as you know, oh, same. About yeah. Ernie Pyle. There's so much we haven't covered. Maybe we can do that in a future date and have you back. Um, I love that. Yeah. By the way, for a, a wonderful book and, and your time today. Um, so Janice Blake, um, one of our stalwarts, she was in Italy with me um, a couple of weeks ago and, and friends. Um, she says, brave men helped me understand what the war was like for my uncle, John, the PFC in the 349th Infantry. And she mentions that she was in Italy recently. And she says she's just gone on online and ordered The Soldier's Truth. So we're selling books for you. <laughs> All right. Oh, I, I really appreciate that. I hope it can fill some gaps. Um, for uh, you. Uh, also, um, I should uh, mention that um, our executive director, Holly, who uh, you uh, met earlier on, um, mm -hmm. her uncle actually, sorry, her great uncle, Romeo Rotondi, was actually, um, actually met Ernie Pyle. So, oh, no kidding. Going back, yeah, going back to your point that so many yes. GIs were so proud. It was like, you know, they better than receiving the Medal of Honor. It was to oh, have so, a yeah. tiny pile. Totally. And and I probably get like maybe one or two messages a week um, really? from people who who say, oh, my dad was in the unit that Ernie was with. I just got one the other day from someone who um, their dad told the story of being in the same foxhole with Ernie Pyle in Italy at some point. And these were really like, you know, incredible yeah. um, experiences for people. Uh, and on that note, I just, again, thank you. That I, I absolutely adored the images at the beginning of your presentation. They were really evocative. And uh, thank you for that wonderful reading.